So welcome everyone. I'm Danny Allen, first year MBA student at the Business School. Thank you for attending uh, the Phillips Pathway for Inclusive Leadership Fireside Chat with Mark Thomas, class of 92 and moderated by Professor Harrigan. Special thank you to the Veterans Alumni Association members in attendance today. Uh, just a reminder, this event will be recorded for future uh, watching in the, in the yeah. Uh, so thank you for attending. Um, before we get started, here's a quick breakdown of the event and the admin notes. So for first year MBAs, this is a Phillips Pathway for Inclusive Leadership event. So we'll provide a link in the chat you can use to register your attendance. Uh, once you check, um, once you check in and fill out the reflection form, you'll have completed your, your uh, PPIL first year requirement. Um, so the event's going to kick off with Q&A between Professor Harrigan and Mark Thomas, and at roughly 645, we'll open it up for questions. Please type your questions in the chat box anytime, and once we open it up, we'll read your questions out to Mark. Um, so first, I'd like to introduce uh, our moderator, our very own Professor Kathy Harrigan, uh, Henry Kravis Professor of Business Leadership with Columbia Business School. Professor Harrigan teaches strategic management courses about corporate growth and turnaround management. She's a specialist in corporate strategy, strategic alliances, mergers and acquisitions, diversification strategy, turnarounds, industry restructuring, and competitive problems um, of mature and declining demand businesses in the industry and competitor analysis. Uh, most important, most recently, uh, Professor Harrigan has researched the role of technological synergies in corporate strategy, and she served on the board of three publicly traded firms and is the author of several prize-winning books on strategy. Thank you, Danny. You got I should it. also mention I am entering my 40th 4 0 year cool. at Columbia Business School. I heard that if you make it to 50 years, they give you a rocking chair. <laughs> You're on fire, almost there. <laughs> I'm working on it. I you certainly to, you, am. You yes. should also mention, Professor, that they hired you right out of uh, grade school. So thank you, you very much, Mark. <laughs> and I have the honor to uh, introduce you to. <clears throat> A former student of mine, Mark Thomas, uh, Commander Thomas, was my student in the autumn of 1991. He was aware of preparations being made under Desert Shield, and he came one day to uh, me at the end of class and explained he was leaving. He was leaving class. He was leaving the program to go and provide uh, support to his uh, his troops in Desert Storm. Uh, Mark has had a remarkable career. He's very good about telling me what's up next as he's gone from being um, in the military and completing a variety of academic degrees, being a McKinsey consultant, being a GE president, and also being a venture capitalist. And now he's back <clears throat> in the saddle. Um, your position is not CEO. It's government affairs. He was recruited for CEO. I remember reading that press release, but he may actually explain to us why he chose to step down from the obvious job in Tempe, Arizona, where he is today. Please give a warm welcome to Mark Thomas. Hmm. Well, uh, thank you, Professor Harrigan, for that outstanding. Uh, oh, you guys even are applauding, too. That's fantastic. Thank you for that outstanding introduction. Um, you know, uh, I don't uh, feel I completely deserve uh, some of those comments, but uh, I will say this much, is that throughout the time that I've known Professor Harrigan, she's been like uh, the, the bellwether, uh, just the standard of uh, teaching excellence at Columbia, not just Columbia, but uh, all the different universities I've been to. I actually was a professor at West Point. I was an adjunct professor at Columbia in the uh, engineering department for a semester. And so I, I kind of know what I'm talking about with respect to uh, 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 professors and pedagogy. And she just brings uh, everything uh, to bear. Every class was uh, never a disappointment. Every class was a, a wealth of knowledge and uh, my hat uh, and, and hands go out to her. So thank you very much, Professor Harrigan. Well, we're going to do a series of short questions uh, to Mark based on things that I already know about him. And then we're going to turn it over to the audience to ask some of the more pointed questions, if that's permissible. Oh, there's Ryan. Hello, Ryan. Um, OK, first question. What is your personal philosophy on how to embody ethical leadership, Mark? 
it's funny too. I, I as uh, you know, you guys were uh, uh, talking to me about uh, doing this uh, a program. I actually went back and I looked at this concept of uh, leadership is no problem. I mean, in the military, we get a ton of it. Okay, uh, it starts uh, when we're either a cadet in ROTC or a cadet at West Point, or even in uh, people that are coming in after college, an officer candidate school. They stress the military stresses leadership, and in fact, uh, we got a plus up because uh, our, our whole thing was we we're gonna we thought we were gonna fight the Soviets and, and uh, Germany and the fold the gap. So we were always not just good leaders, but also good followers and good mentors to our troops because we felt that if you know one guy got popped then the next guy would take over. And so uh, this concept of ethical leadership, now that's another, that's another uh, a piece of a, of a longer story. Uh, we have a model. In fact, I've had this model all my life of uh, what type of a leader, what kind of a person that I want to be. Okay. Uh, there were three pieces to that. There was this uh, virtual type of uh, ethical person, the, 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 the virtuous uh, person that is kind of uh, through either your parents or through uh, maybe the church or through uh, 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 education, informal or formal, you were being told that, hey, uh, you have to do the right thing, okay? And the right thing was defined as something very, very magnanimous, okay? Uh, in fact, as a child, you guys all were told, don't do this. Those are the wrong things. So the opposite of that is to do the right thing. So the virtuous guy is kind of built on some type of a, a standard that an institution, uh, your parents or whomever is kind of uh, putting forward to you. Then there's the uh, consensual or consequential uh, ethics character that uh, these people are ends justify the means, okay? Hopefully the, hopefully the ends are good. And so, you know, the means are gonna kind of uh, build into that. Um, you know, these guys are basically, uh, well, we, we hope that we get it done right. If we don't do it right, then, well, we were just trying to do something uh, good. It was intentional. But the, the guy that really rings true to me is the um, uh, deontological uh, ethics person. This is a, a duty or an obligation-driven person. It fits in well with the military because we get, or anybody who's played any kind of organized sports, you get this concept of you have to uh, take one for the team. You have to sacrifice yourself. You have to do, you're doing the right thing because it's the organization. And it's always that the, the team comes first. And so when I went about uh, kind of doing my professional career, I like the, uh, the the first one was the, the virtual guy. I was always honest with myself. Uh, you know, I, I don't have a pure heart. I mean, my mom had a pure heart, but I don't have a pure heart. Uh, you know, and then the consequential person was that was too random for me. I couldn't do that. You know, hope for the best. You know, prep. Uh, you know, uh, 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 prep for the worst. Hope for the best. But the uh, the duty guy really rung true with me because of the obligation, the team stuff. That's how I prepare for it. I look at any situation, and I don't worry about myself. I worry about the organization. In the military, they taught us, you know, the three M's, mission, men, and myself. Of course, they should have said mission, men and women, and myself, okay? But it was, you know, mission, men, myself. And you had to take care of the mission first uh, and then take care of your troops. And then you didn't worry about yourself. If you took care of those first two, you didn't have a problem. So that's kind of how I go into every situation of how can I make this uh, organization better? Okay, I'm not so much worried about myself. I never worry about the capital, the money coming in, because, uh, you know, to me, I was always this uh, uh, professor wannabe. It was always education. It was always knowledge I was going after, okay, and trying to bring other people up to the standard and make them exceed. In fact, I'm one of these guys that I love it when the student exceeds the teacher, okay? I, I've mentored, I don't know, maybe about 20 people in my lifetime. Uh, my, my last mentor right now, she's in business school. She actually uh, is at Notre Dame. And we talk like every day. And it's the concept of, she's always asking me like, how can I ever repay you? And I always tell her, it's like, you don't, don't worry about repaying me. In fact, help somebody that doesn't look like you. Okay, Mark, uh, would you mind going back to the time when you were with the special forces and tell us about the hardest ethical conflict that you had to deal with? Classified or unclassified? Which well, version? one that you can talk about. Okay. Okay. So I'll give you an unclassified version. Okay. It's a real, it's a real simple one. My battalion commander, uh, Colonel Tagney, now retired uh, Major General Tagney, great guy, ended up being a good mentor for me. And so I was a second lieutenant going into a special forces organization. Um, you don't have second lieutenants or lieutenants in special ops. Uh, that normally, if you're an officer, you're a captain, 
you're supposed to have at least three or four years in. The way I got into special ops is I got into a ranger battalion, okay? And then in 1984, 85, the rangers came underneath special operations command, all right, uh, 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 special operations forces. And so I then got a letter that invited me uh, for selection and assessment. Uh, that's about a two or three week program where they put you through everything. Once you pass selection and assessment, you end up at the Q course, the qualification course, and you're in another uh, well, about a year of training before you get to the unit. But uh, Colonel Tagney uh, was one of these guys that he was always saying, go out and do great things for God and country. Okay. He was always one of these guys that, you know, put the organization first. Uh, he had the wherewithal to kind of look at me and say, hey, uh, don't understand why second lieutenants in special ops, but what do you want to do for the unit, the organization? Okay. And so with respect to like the first, I'll call it a simple ethics thing. Uh, I was on the battalion staff for two months before I got a special forces A team. And he tasked me with creating a program uh, and looking at all the different elements uh, uh, of our organization and figuring out were they really doing the training, okay, that they said they were doing? Or as Colonel Tagney put it, or were they down there skill crafting everything? He's talking about the, the companies and the, and, the, uh, and the detachments. Well, I had to go down there. And again, people don't really want me because I'm a second lieutenant. These guys are all captains, sergeant majors, senior enlisted people. And so I had to go down and look at all their records. And I found out that, yeah, uh, Charlie Company was skill crafting things. And so they had to basically be reckoned with. And I had to go back and tell the battalion commander that there was a problem down there. Okay. Uh, didn't want to throw out any names because, again, brand new. But we we're trying to fix something. And so we ended up doing this. Instead of, like, slapping Charlie Company on the wrist or penalizing whomever, we created a, a different training regiment where I was in charge of all the physical fitness stuff, the testing stuff. And I created a cadre of uh, uh, enlisted guys that went out and we tested to a standard. And once we tested to a standard, everybody seemed to do well. Uh, back in the old days, everybody got, and some of you guys that are familiar with the military, it's 300 points to maximize a physical fitness exam. So in a special forces unit, uh, particularly as an organization, they all had 300 points. Everybody, 300 points, 300 points, 300 points, right? It's like, that's um, a statistical uh, phenomenon. You know, it, it, that's kind of hard to do. When we retested them, um, they actually didn't drop that much. They dropped to like on average 291, 289, things like that, which wasn't that bad. That was very good. I mean, the, mil the, 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 the regular military is a lot lower than that. So people learn from that and they began to appreciate me, okay? Same thing happened when I went into the civilian world uh, but I started off in quality and nobody likes a quality guy because a quality guy is a snitch. Okay. This guy is going to highlight the negative and make everybody look bad, uh, badly. However, I'm one of these guys that said, you know, I'm here to help uh, how to fix it. The big ethical dilemma that we had in the military was a classified op. I'll tell you the, per the, the periphery of it without going into great detail. Uh, we did, this is back in the eighties guys. And so uh, it's cold war. And uh, we were helping any country that was anti-communist, uh, we were helping, okay? I was in the 5th Special Forces. Our area of orientation uh, back then was uh, Africa uh, and Southwest Asia, okay? I operated uh, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa and a lot of the uh, uh, post-Francophonic colonies, ex-Francophonic colonies. Uh, I went to language school to speak uh, French. I picked up some Arabic. I had already spoken German in, in high school and college. So I was pretty good with, uh, with languages. The ethical, ethical dilemma was uh, one night uh, the Americans got called into a, a quick meeting. And it was being delivered by our company commander who he was doing it in French. And he was actually, uh, we're, we're advising African soldiers, but there was no African soldiers there. It was just the Americans and the, uh, um, I, I'd say, remnants of the ex-French uh, colonial forces, okay? They were a paracommando unit, but our company commander gave it in French. I had just learned French, so I'm having a problem keeping up, but he mentioned that we were going to be uh, jumping and seizing an airfield, and we were going to use a certain type of jump technique that I knew that we shouldn't be doing because the parachutes that we had, we were not, they didn't match up, Okay. I had just finished probably a, a jump master course and uh, in the army, all our, all our books, like regular books, white pages and, and black lettering, this one page was white, a white page, pardon, it was a black page with white lettering that said, 
absolutely under no conditions are you guys supposed to jump this type of technique. And so I brought it up in the meeting and I said, uh, you know, pardon me, sir. Uh, I don't think we're supposed to. And the guy told me to stop talking. Okay. And he kept talking. I'm like, God, he's, he's briefing something that's probably going to get some people killed. Uh, and I have to say, um, I'm not completely selfish. I was thinking also about myself, but probably going to get me killed too. Okay. So uh, I brought it up a second time, you know, uh, blah, 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 blah. I do not. And he cut me off again. And then when I brought it up the third time, he told me, uh, uh, at ease, Lieutenant, like, shut up. Okay. After the meeting was over, I went and I found uh, the other detachment commanders and also the African officers who were going to be in charge of this drop. I had uh, two aircraft, uh, two C 130s. They uh, set about 64 to 68 combat equipped jumpers. Okay. I wasn't so much worried about the propeller driven aircraft. We also had jets, C 141s, that were coming in with about a, 155 people. Uh, this technique is called ADEP, alternate door exiting procedure, either one or two. Okay. And I'm going into great detail because I'm trying to make you guys understand that uh, if you have certain types of parachutes, you cannot jump two jumpers at the same time because the, 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 the prop blast will blow the jumpers into each other, they'll wrap up, and then there's just a ball shooting down to the ground, okay? Very, very bad. So I told, this is the night before, I told uh, the troops that, hey, I was going to disobey an, uh, an order that I felt was unlawful. This is an unlawful order. Uh, we should not do that. I'm going to jump a different uh, jump technique that actually will prevent us from uh, uh, coiling up and hitting each other, and I advise all the other guys to do that also. Okay, you guys want to follow this 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 drop uh, technique? They all agreed. I remember the African officer uh, said to me, um, "You know, Mark, you 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 are so good to us. You you you're saving us." <laughs> I'm like, "Yeah, I'm saving you and and me also, right?" Well, that morning, we were practicing in the hangar, and uh, uh, a French uh, major came in and told uh, the African unit that no, they're going to go back and do the regular jump that we were going to do. I grabbed that major, I'd been authorized that if the French got out of control, just to grab them by their, we call it a stack and swivel, grab them by the back of their shirt and their pants and throw them out of there. So I threw them out of there. The guy said I was going to get in trouble, uh, but whatever. We jumped that day, okay? And I was on the elite aircraft, um, you know, basically spotting the drop zone. We're going to seize the Seraphil. We're going to take down their con tower. We're going to grab this thing for us. And we dropped okay using my technique or i shouldn't say my technique but the appropriate technique and we didn't have any fatalities we didn't have anything the two propeller driven aircraft were taking the front of the airfield and the back of the airfield the c-141 would come in and, and and drop more people in the middle of the airfield and then what the americans do is we seize an airfield and we push out we push out until we can bring in the the heavier equipment and land it well, the 141 uh, dropped also that they jumped too. And you could see it, look up in the sky and you could see one guy hit uh, uh, another guy and they hit a third guy. So three guys all wrapped up together and uh, they hit the ground and that was that, okay? They were killed. And it ticked me off. I was very upset about that because that could have been prevented. After we completed our mission, of course we ran to assist these guys Two guys were dead. One guy was still alive, but he's ble bleeding from every orifice. This is in 19, the 80s when uh, the AIDS epidemic had just happened. And so we were trying to do a blood transfusion. And our medics, special forces medics, greatest guys in the world, they asked for a uh, B positive donor. Okay. And nobody spoke up because back then they were afraid of, does AIDS, can you get it? If you, tr if you give blood, do you get it? And it's like, of course, we know now. No, you won't get it if you give blood. Come on. But people dummied up. They didn't want to say anything. And so I said, hey, guys, here, I pull out my dog tags. I said, everybody pull their dog tags out. This is an ethical issue, right? Uh, let me see your dog tags. I'm A positive, okay? Finally had a guy, he actually volunteered, he was B positive, and he went and gave blood to the African soldier. He didn't make it. Now, here's where the really big ethical dilemma comes in. When you have an accident like that, a fatality, there's going to be an investigation, okay? Uh, the investigation uh, occurred when we got back to Fort Bragg. Now, remember that major who said, hey, uh, we're going to do it this way? Well, all of a sudden he said, nobody recalled him saying that, all right? My friend who was commanding that uh, C-141 jet aircraft 
who was forced to drop the wrong way, uh, he was being prosecuted for uh, negligence and a bunch of other things. He was going to get kicked out of the military. Okay. It, and that's if he was lucky. If not, he's going to go to Leavenworth. We call it going to Leavenworth long tour. Uh, as this investigation is going on, I told my friend, uh, I said, mention my name during the next inquiry because I couldn't be seen as going in and, and, and ratting this guy, the, the major out. I wanted to be introduced into this, uh, this concept. And so um, they, you know, subpoenaed me and I went and I testified. Before I testified, I told them, okay, that, hey, I'm here to tell the truth, everything, uh, the truth. And I told the truth. I told them exactly what happened. And the investigating officer said, it's interesting that only you and one other guy, okay, told the truth. Everybody else kind of, we don't recall. Well, that major was relieved of command, okay? And he was going to be kicked out of the military. His parting gift to me was he wrote, uh, one letter input into my officer efficiency report. Okay, he didn't get me, he didn't get me into it. In fact, the, the letter started off like this. I was actually in the latrine and uh, good to go. Thank you. I was in the latrine and my company commander came to me and said, hey, Mark, have you seen this? And, you know, I washed my hands. And I took the letter and I read it and I was like, what the? It started off with uh, Lieutenant Thomas, one of the most uh, uh, outstanding officers I've ever met in my life. However, and then it went south. Okay, just tore me apart. And so I lost it. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to go over to Charlie company. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tear this guy apart. Uh, our company command, my company commander said, let's go talk to the old man. So we went to talk to the, the battalion commander and the battalion commander summoned that major who wrote the bad letter. And he said, Hey, did you write this? He goes, yes, sir. It's all professional. You know, uh, Mark needs to. And so he said, well, you don't like Mark much, do you? And the guy, well, sir, it's all, and he cut him off and he said, and Mark doesn't like you either. And he tore up the letter and he threw it out and he threw that guy away. Now that guy ended up getting kicked out of the military. So again, that was an ethical dilemma. I knew that in a hostile uh, environment, a combat zone, we didn't actually call them that back then, but they were, okay, is that um, you have a lot of power as a, as a commander. You have a lot of power as a commander. And so um, this guy, he couldn't be challenged in the field he had to be challenged when he got back to the, 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 as we call it, back to the world. He had to be challenged back at Fort Bragg, and uh, his veil of secrecy kind of fell apart. So that's a, an ethical issue. That's a scary story. That's a crazy story, and it's really funny, too, is that they asked me um, why. It's, it's kind of funny, too. When we were flying back on the aircraft, we had three, three dead bodies. Uh, the French... Uh, commander at the time, he did not want those bodies on the plane. He wanted to put them on a, on a truck and take them back to the Capitol. Um, I insisted that on these bodies, they have to come with us, come on. And so when we're flying back to the Capitol, that African country, the French commander asked me, he was a colonel, he had, he said, hey, how's my English? I said, oh, mon colonel, uh, vos anglais, très bien, very good. Your English is very good. And he said, uh, I said, how's my French? He said, you need to work on it. You need to work on your French, right? And I'm like, Okay, fine. Well, he asked me, he goes, why were you so concerned? Okay, why were you so concerned about these African soldiers? And I go like, what are you talking about? I said, um, you know, the, the Americans, we, we did jumps like that a long time ago. We got people injured, so we outlawed that. And he said, but I don't understand why you were so concerned. After all, they're just Africans. And it really made me so upset. I had to get up and walk away. Uh, I had to get up and walk away from uh, that situation. I had to walk to the end of the aircraft. But again, you get placed in these situations. And the bottom line is this, I don't, um, you know, uh, say that I'm the guy that knows everything about ethics and leadership. I don't. I'm constantly learning. But I am the guy that will say this, I can't be the judge of me and my actions. I, I have to allow a higher authority, either a commander, a boss, or whatever, uh, be that judge and tell me that, no, you didn't do anything wrong. Okay, or you did do something wrong, and this is how you can fix it. Mark, if you we could get one short version of a hard ethical dilemma that you have had to deal with after leaving the special forces, then I'll turn open the uh, questions to the audience. But I want to contrast the kinds of things you're facing now with the kinds of things you were facing in the special forces. And that's a good question, Professor. And so, uh, uh, none of my vignettes are short, but I'll try to make this in as short as possible. Uh, when I became a president and CEO of a company, okay, in the in the General Electric uh, sphere, 
Um, I, uh, I remember Jack Welch uh, being this dynamic person. It had been turned over. We had just, uh, Welch was there for a month when I was there, and then he retired, and so we brought on Jeff Himmel. Jeff Himmel, great guy. I met him several times before. I, I guess he was impressed with me. So he uh, looked at my record and uh, promoted me to become president and CEO of an aviation division in Texas. Okay. And as president and CEO, actually was chairman too, because it was a joint venture between GE and uh, SNECMA. As president and CEO, you can see everything. So I saw everything. And I saw that um, the women, unfortunately, in our company were not being compensated uh, just like the men were. They were not being equally compensated. So I looked into that. I brought it to the attention of the HR people um, uh, in my company and then above me uh, in Cincinnati. And I was told, OK, fix it. So I fixed it. OK. And I made it a meritocracy. In fact, I put in uh, only 5% of my of the input was subjective. It was the CEO input. Everything was based on merit, you know, sales, leadership, teamwork, uh, developing, whatever. It was all there. Um, we ended up delivering in that company. We went from 150 million to about 242 million in revenues. But more importantly, we went from 9 million to about 40, 41 million in op profit. Okay, phenomenal. In fact, uh, didn't know it at the time, but we led the division uh, in, in a lot of different metrics. But I had uh, a couple of guys uh, quit. They, were, they, they quit. They didn't, they didn't want to work at uh, the aviation company. Uh, in fact, it wasn't that they didn't want to work for me. They, need, they actually got better offers. They got way better offers than what we could do. But uh, I was being penalized by uh, my boss who, not, you know, remember, I got appointed by the CEO of the whole company. And I didn't know this at the time, but my boss actually wanted somebody else in that role. So when I called my boss to tell him that, hey, we had two, three people that, you know, resigned, he said, and I remember this, who's chewing peanuts in my ear. He said, well, um, we're going to have to uh, figure out, a, we're going to have to basically come down there in about two or three weeks and remove you. And I remember being startled, like, you know, what, 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 what did I do? What, what are you talking about? And so it became a little bit of a witch hunt and it ended up being two guys. Okay. So General Electric, fantastic company. These guys make great products. I, I wish we were back to where we were when I was there. We were, you know, number two in the world on the fortune 500 list. I think now we're like 18 or 22 uh, for whatever reason, but um, you know, there ended up being two guys. I call them knuckleheads that push this issue uh, to the point where I ended up having a, a higher, um, legal counsel, uh, and we eventually worked it all out. But I remember at the end of the whole thing, uh, the uh, mediator, okay, retired judge, he actually said this uh, to the G representatives. They, he said, um, hey, um, you guys didn't do your homework on that guy, okay? And that guy actually was trying to basically uh, help your company. He, he was taking all the ethics, the, uh, the, the, the leadership that they had trained us to do. And remember, I found a wrong. Okay, that the women were being underpaid, ended up being the minorities were being underpaid also for whatever stupid reason. It was a company that GE had purchased and they had not properly integrated into the into the uh, into GE, but nevertheless, they had been there for five years, so they should have fixed it. But once I fixed it, I guess I fixed it too well. Uh, everything ended up being amicable. In fact, you know, um, things were worked out. More uh, um, uh, processes and procedures were put in place to make sure stuff like that. Been happening. In fact, people would ask me and say, Mark, what do you want um, uh, from this outcome? It's like, so that it doesn't happen to anybody else. Okay. It should never happen to anybody else. All right. Is that, you know, picture this. I work for you and I'm making you a quarter of a billion dollars. Okay. Uh, almost 50 million bucks in pure cash. And, uh, you know, leading every metric. And it's not just me, it's the team that I built uh, ar around me to help me. And all of a sudden you say, I don't, I don't want you anymore. In fact, my attorney said like, your problem was you rock the boat. And I never, I, I still don't understand that because I always thought money was green. I never look at people based on their skin uh, uh, complexion or their gender or their, 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 their ethnicity or anything. I, I don't look at people like that. I look at people as being assets until proven wrong. You gotta, you gotta prove that you're not an asset to me. Okay, thank you. We're gonna uh, let Danny choose which of the uh, questions that are coming in through the chat, uh, Mark will answer next. Thank sure. you. 
Sure. Thanks, Mark, for those stories. Uh, we have one question from Carl Kovitz says, knowing that the improper jump could result in fatalities, is there anything now that you think you could have done differently? Uh, it's funny, too. 2020 hindsight. So maybe I should have gone out and laid down in, in front of the uh, aircraft. I mean, I don't know. Uh, remember, I control. I was a first lieutenant. Uh, I did have a hundred and thirty person uh, allied company that I was advising. And so our two aircraft that carried the, the 64 and 64, ours did it right, okay? The bird that didn't do it right was a 141 miles and miles behind me. So what could I have done differently? Maybe I should have uh, that morning got on a statcom and uh, uh, ratted that major out. Maybe I should have done that, okay? So yeah, I mean, you can always kind of look back and say like, what could you have done differently? But uh, that's, that was probably it. I, I probably should have like raised it higher quicker. Next question is from Joe Rosen. What are your thoughts about universal universal national service to help unify our polarized nation via shared experiences? You know, it's funny too. When I was a White House fellow, we brought up that concept to Colin Powell, who is the White House fellow, right? And it's like, you know, people that have served in the military, um, it's a fantastic um, experience, okay? Got a lot of good, got a lot of bad, but it's a fantastic experience, but it's not for everybody, okay? Uh, the first question is, you know, first, we're a democracy. Uh, we don't have a draft, okay? The draft, those things don't work, okay? You end up getting a hodgepodge of different types of people, some really good people that wanted to be there, but you get some people that don't want to be there. And you guys all know that if you have somebody in your organization that doesn't really want to be there, they're not going to really do that well. So I'm not for a universal kind of a mandatory service. I would like to see, and we, we mentioned this to the general too, I would like to see that, you know, as a kid, uh, all of us, we were rushed to get to college, okay? In fact, my father even asked me, he's like, what's the hurry? It's like, well, because this guy's trying, he got there at 16, I want to get there at 16, 17. What I would like to see is, I like that concept of a gap year, that one year, okay, between high school and college, but go out and do something for the community. Go work in a hospital. Uh, go work in a homeless shelter. Go work in a soup kitchen. Okay. If if the military is your thing or uh, being a first responder is your thing, go do that. But it gives people more of a sense of um, of ownership in the country itself because you help to build it. All right. That's not to say that the people that don't serve are, are not first responders or don't work in soup kitchens, or whatever, uh, don't contribute. They do. Everybody does. But again, I, I, I like the concept of trying to persuade people as opposed to ordering people. And leadership, to me, there's two models. There's a transactional leadership model. This guy is a, or woman is a person, you're going to do what I tell you to do because I'm in charge, I'm the boss. And then there's a transcendental kind of a leader. That's harder to do, okay? 70% of the people, 75% of the leaders are these transactional guys that you just do what I tell you to do. 20 to 30% are these transcendental people who are trying to get you to do things and it makes it seem like it's your idea. An example of that, John F. Kennedy, okay, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, Martin Luther King, okay, these guys were trans uh, trans transcendental people who were able to get people to do things and think that it was their idea. And that's, that's a better leadership model. The problem is it takes a long time to cultivate that. Great, thank you. I love the idea of a gap year uh, for community service. Uh, sounds sounds great. Um, next question is from Ryan Leach. He says, what's more important, winning or being an ethical leader? <laughs> okay, so uh, that's a great question, Ryan. Uh, we were always told this question. It's simpler than that. It's like, do you want to be right or you want to make money? Okay, mm -hmm. in business. You want to be right or you want to make money? When somebody, the first time I heard that, I was like, well, I'd like to do them both. It's like, no, you can only do one. You want to be right, you want to make money, okay? In business, it's you, you better make some money, okay, in order to change things to make them right, all right? There's a lot of people, in fact, engineers uh, suffer from this one thing of you got to be right because an engineer, I'm an engineer, we're taught uh, you better build that thing correctly because if you don't, I was, I'm a civil engineer. If you don't build the bridge right, if you uh, uh, forget to put in the elasticity coefficient, that thing's going to oscillate from the wind, it's gonna fall apart and kill some people, all right? So we're always taught and it's, it's hammered into us, you, you better be right, you better have your numbers right, okay? Um, I wish the world were built this way, that you could always be right and always make money, be successful, okay? 
uh, now that I'm a lot older, and I guess it was always the way I thought because of being altruistic, I always I want to be I want to do the ethical things uh, because I like to be able to sleep at night. Um, I like to be able to, to say I was a guy. It doesn't matter if I was the, the most wealthiest guy or the most uh, the not the most knowledgeable person. But I remember at McKinsey, I got the title uh, kind of unofficially from one of our partners up. You know, Mark, you may not be the smartest guy at McKinsey, but you have the, the best integrity, the most ethics. Yeah, that's an excellent title. Good for you. <laughs> Thank you. Good for you. Danny? Yeah, so next question from Jeff Laupola. Uh, Mark, uh, thanks, thanks for the presentation. What skills do you take with you from the military and skills uh, that you, you need to leave behind in the military to be successful as a business leader? That's an excellent question. Okay, so the military, the, the big skill that we had, we call them the five C's of leadership. Okay, because the military is great in getting you to understand how to organize people, how to move resources from, you know, A to Z. But, you know, the, the five C's of leadership were courage, okay? Courage to do the, 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 the hard right as opposed to the easy wrong. Um, candor, to tell the truth, even if it might mean your demise, okay? And I often, in fact, uh, I've told on myself when I made a mistake. I went to my boss and said, I, I screwed up. Uh, please help me fix this. Uh, competence is that you better know what you're talking about, okay? Because people aren't, you know, people aren't stupid. Humans are extremely smart. Doesn't matter who they are, where they came from, they'll figure it out, and they'll figure out if this guy's just blowing smoke or not. And then commitment. Yeah, we always said never get off the boat unless you intend to go all the way. You got to be 100% into this thing, 100% dedicated and devoted to it. And then it was uh, communication was the last uh, of the C's. Communication, you had to have clear, concise, and continuous communication up and down the chain. You told everybody everything. Remember, the military, the American military, it was small compared to what we were going to face against the Russians. So you had to have good communication up and down the chain. Now, what you can leave behind in the military is this. And this is the one thing, it, it, I was hard-headed, it took me a while. It's like, hey, buddy, everybody didn't think like you, <laughs> okay? Okay. Um, people may not be motivated like you were motivated in the military. You have to find a way. In the military, it's, it's simple to motivate people because, you know, we always said a bullet is a non-discriminator, it'll kill you. So if you don't work as a team to prevent this from happening, guess what? You'll end up coming back in a box. Uh, that doesn't per se exist in the outside world and civilian world that on your job, there's somebody who's like trying to shoot at you or whatever like that, okay? So you have to understand that when you're dealing with the, the civilian world, you have a multitude of different uh, people and personalities. Not to say you don't have that in the military, but they may have different motivations. They may have uh, different desires. They may have whatever. So you need to try to uh, understand how these people are, are, try, are thinking. Whenever I go into a job, I always do something called a one-on-one -on -one interview. And I sit uh, whomever, you know, the people down, and I talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, and I ask them three questions. One. What have they been doing for the company? What has the company been doing for them? And what do they want to do? Okay. What's their next job? And these things work out pretty well. Thank you. That's an excellent set of questions when you're visiting with all those little startup companies. That's exactly right. Danny, you got another one? Yeah. So next question is from Ilan Nora. She, she said, when you're not in charge and you have to follow orders, oh. how do you... Uh, voice dissent. Hmm. It, it's funny too. Uh, um, recently, I was talking to my wife about when I was a cadet. My wife was complaining that I don't, um, I don't uh, cook or wash the dishes enough or something or whatever. It's like you know, okay, fine, uh, okay, boss, I'll, I'll do whatever you say. But I told her, I said, you know, as a as a cadet in ROTC, uh, we often had to do really menial things. For example, uh, we all got KP duty. Everybody does that, and you got the KP kitchen police. OK, uh, I end up having the side sink and I must have washed about 2000 dishes that day. And I remember after that, t uh, walking on the on the uh, on the cafeteria floor and telling people, hey, you don't need two, uh, you know, you don't need two glasses. You can do that in one glass or whatever. <laughs> OK, so people resented that. But whatever. it was like, you don't need it. You don't need all those forks. You only need one fork. Come on. OK, because you're making my life a, a lot harder. But um, it, it th this concept of. You're trying to, you know, understand people, figure out what they what they want, and and uh, and, and how to kind of perfect and, and do exactly what 
try to get try to get them to move to a point where they're they're trying to accomplish something that's very meaningful and very fruitful is extremely important. What was the rest of the question? Uh, it was uh, if like how do you how do you voice dissent um, when you when you're not in charge? No. Okay, so <laughs> there's a couple ways. Okay, so you know we we're always told as leaders uh, the worst thing that ever happened to you is that people quit. Okay, because your your number one asset it, it kind of sounds cliche-ish is that you know to your face they tell you hey man you're my most important asset you you are intellectual property you human are the most important asset in that company okay but some leaders are they're they're in the back counting their pennies and counting dimes and figuring out how to streamline the workforce and all these other stuff too how to redistribute the workforce or whatever politically correct thing the best way to voice dissent is i found this out is to walk up and face it Okay, don't don't embarrass the leader publicly. Don't do that because some people they take this stuff to heart as opposed to mine. I'd always wait and maybe talk after uh, hours or somewhere and say, hey, and I always start off always start off with a positive, guys. If you're gonna criticize criticize somebody and say something negative, start off with a positive. Hey, that was a fantastic speech. In fact, I went to a political fundraiser uh, the other day and I didn't agree with everything that guy said, but I shook his hand and said that was a fantastic speech. Oh, thank you. However, okay, and I voiced a little bit of dissent. It wasn't a slap, you know, in the face or upside the head. It was a little bit of a dissent. And he asked me, in fact, the leader will ask you, why do you think that way? And if you can explain it to them, we were always taught in the military and in General Electric too, anybody can voice a problem. Anybody can identify a problem. Anybody can do that. Anybody can be a critic, okay? You had to be able to, uh, if you got a problem, you identify a problem, have a solution too. It may not be the best solution, but at least you're thinking about, hey, how can I make this place better? Excellent. Thank you, Mark. Sure. A question from Amanda. Yeah. Um, next question's from Amanda. She said, can you tell us more about your White House fellowship experience and share any advice for MBAs interested in working in the public sector or business roles that directly support solving some of our nation's toughest challenges? Great question. And I was very fortunate. In fact, uh, Professor Harrigan helped me become a White House fellow. She, in fact, were one of the four recommendations that actually put me over the top. Um, uh, becoming a fellow is very difficult. This program was established in 1964 by then President Johnson under uh, the advice of John Gardner, who ended up being Secretary of Labor. Fantastic gentleman. But the fellowship was, was uh, created to uh, have people midway in their careers, okay? guys that were uh, guys and, and women that were, were excelling and to bring them into DC for one year, have them work for a supernumerary, either president, uh, vice president, chief of staff, secretary of state, secretary of the defense, whatever, have them work for one year on their staff. Uh, it's called a fellowship, but I go like, it's not really a fellowship because you're, you gotta hit the ground running, okay? The way to kind of get to the fellowship and I'll be happy, you guys can give them my email, I'll be happy to talk to people individually about becoming a White House fellow, because right now um, you need uh, these, this kind of an organization, an organization like that. Everybody that became a fellow, in fact, the year that I became a fellow, you know, I think they got they 50,000 applications went out. They got like 2,000 back because people self-eliminate. They read the uh, bio and they go like, man, this, this, this person walks on water. I could never become a fellow. I mean, I did that. I looked and was like, man, these people walk on water. I don't know, it'd be the grace of God that I, I get in. But uh, 2000 came back. Uh, they went ahead and uh, uh, did their filtering uh, process. And I could be in great detail about how they do that. And they, send, they sent those 2000 and went to 150. 150 of those guys went to 10 different regionals, 15 people each. The regional is a day and a half. It's uh, uh, sponsored by supernumeraries in that region. So I went to the St. Louis regional and so the uh, it was the editor in chief of the St. Louis Sun Times. He was he was on the panel. Uh, 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 Bill Clinton's um, uh, um, uh, minister. In fact, uh, Bill Clinton went to two churches. He went to the white church. He went to the black church. He let, went to the black church because he said he liked the music. Okay, so that guy was there. Uh, we had a guy who was a paraplegic who created his own organ uh, company. We had a bunch of different people, and they asked you questions. There are no questions that are off limits. And you make it through, and then you go to the next round is the nationals. The nationals is a four and a half or four and a quarter day period. And those people are presidential appointees. They're on the President's Commission of White House Fellows. 
Uh, you had guys like Stansfield Turner back, back then. He was a former director of the CIA. Mary Steenberg, an Academy Award winning actress. Edwin Moses, Olympic uh, gold medalist. Uh, uh, the Honorable Robert Yazzie was the uh, Chief Justice of the Navajo Nation. Guys like that, people like that, that are asking you tons of questions and uh, you make it through. There's a couple of events you have to participate in. Of the, uh, remember we started, uh, I don't know, 50,000 went to 2,000, went to 150, went to about 44, 45, ended up being 17. Those 17 names are then given to the President of the United States and uh, he and hopefully she soon uh, will uh, check the box and give them the thumbs up. So you become a presidential appointee. Uh, I ended up working in the office of the vice president, uh, working uh, for Al Gore. Um, I had on my portfolio, everybody got a geographic region. I had Africa since I'd worked there. And then I had a bunch of functional areas, like I had the environment, because I'm a civil slash environmental engineer. Uh, I had uh, human rights. I had UN peacekeeping. I had, um, uh, heck, you name it, I, I had it. And it's funny, I always say, be careful what you, Colin Powell's like fifth rule, be careful what you wish for, because you just might get it. I end up working like 20, 22 hour days, okay, six days a week, sometimes seven, and uh, trying to make sure, in fact, I was always like worried, like, man, a lot of stuff is riding on what I do. I don't want to screw up and get anybody killed or get something blown up. But ended up staying in the White House for almost two years. I always uh, tease say uh, kind of tongue in cheek. Yeah, Gore said that I messed up the first year, so he kept me a, a year, okay? And then I'm still in the Army. The Army uh, said, well, you worked for the Democrats for a couple of years, you gotta go work for the Republicans. I became a legislative fellow and went to the U.S. Senate and worked for Senator Dirk Kimthorne from Idaho. Great guy, I wish he had run for president. I worked again on armed services and environmental public works. Now, the reason why I tell you about this program, and I'm glad that someone asked about the White House Fellowship, is that there's other fellowships out there that, um, bring you in and out of government. There's legislative fellows, there's White House fellows, there's there's a judicial fellows, there's all these guys. And, uh, and I apologize, I use guys as generic because I grew up on the West Coast, so uh, men and women, okay, so my, my apology. Remember when, when the women take over the world, Mark was a friend, so you guys be nice, okay, to me. But anyway, um, they get you, it's not so much that um, you are thrust in a situation that you are not too familiar with, which is good because it's going to stretch you, but you learn so much. I learned a ton of stuff working in the White House, okay? I mean, uh, the Clinton administration, that was a nexus. Um, sure, we had some uh, uh, party strife back and forth, but it, it was nothing compared to what's going on now where the political parties are trying to eliminate each other. Okay, back then, yeah, you know, uh, one guy, one, one person wins, one person loses. We'll get you back in two years or four years. But our political situation now uh, is, is, is one that's of dire uh, strength. And, and in fact, these parties are trying to eliminate each other, which is, is, is not democracy. It's, it, it shouldn't be done. If I can quickly intervene, something that was useful that you learned during your White House years explains why you are not the CEO, but are the chief government officer of Rep Technologies. Can you see? Yeah. That? So, um, the, you know, the board hired me to come in as a CEO. Okay. Now, Rep Technologies is a is a fantastic company. They make something called the Bola Wrap, which is a a remote restraint device. Basically, it shoots out an eight foot uh, cord uh, lasso, wraps around a person, renders them uh, somewhat immobile. So it's it's um. Uh, less than lethal. Um, it doesn't harm anybody. It allows uh, the police and the subject to calm down a bit. Okay. And so, you know, had these things, things been available, uh, they probably could have, in fact, we always say could have possibly saved lives and saved careers, possibly. Okay. Um, we also have something called Rap Reality. We just bought a, a company and we do a virtual reality. So we're doing a lot of training and putting law enforcement and other people, first responders in different types of scenarios where you're practicing and practicing uh, to get it right. And so what happened was when I was a CEO here, I was brought in to do kind of like a turnaround. Remember, uh, I mean, from Professor uh, uh, Harrigan, turnaround, okay? I was a turnaround guy. And um, I did a, a bang up job, but I also kept saying things like this. You know, we need somebody in DC to do lobbying because if we're gonna get this whole thing done right, you know, you gotta be in DC to do lobbying. You gotta be in the state capitals because you know, law enforcement, they have these finite budgets and for um, us to think that the, the police uh, by themselves can purchase these things 
is kind of like, yeah, well, yeah, they can, but they need help. They need the, a fund site, grants, okay? We're actually trying to uh, get legislation passed in this Congress that talks about de-escalation, okay? Talks about uh, uh, remote constraints. It talks about um, having uh, a, a capability so that the police uh, and the subject, they don't get hurt. In fact, a lot of people don't realize that when you're su uh, struggling with somebody, you can get injured too. A lot of police officers have been injured. Now, you know, I always say this because people always argue, Hey, uh, what about this whole defunding the police? What about this, that, you know, it's like, you do not want to defund the police, guys. I, I've operated in countries that the rule of law was not there. So you had 12 and 14 year old kids walk around with AK-47s, right? You don't want to do that. What you do want to do is do something called police reform. And that's what they're looking into. Of how do you make the police, okay, and the communities work better together? And the way to do that is you have to open a dialogue, a complete dialogue so that people are talking. Okay, they talk now, but not enough. Um, you know, it happened back in the 80s where all of a sudden, the because of the war on drugs, law enforcement started getting uh, militarized. They started getting armored up. And you see these guys. And when you have a peaceful demonstration, and all of a sudden the riot squad guys show up, it makes you very uneasy. Okay, uh, I always tell the law enforcement guys, and they know this, but I kind of remind them of, guys, th this is not an occupation uh, uh, force. OK, uh, it, it's 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 one America. It's all of us for each other. Uh, nobody's trying to question your authority. I remember, you know, I'm my, my biggest uh, um, issue uh, with respect to law enforcement is I, I speed. So if you're going to rebroadcast this, so the cops will be looking for me. But I, I tend to speed because I want to get from point A to point B and I get pulled over. And the first thing I do when they ask me, hey, you know, why would you get pulled over or, or do you know why you got pulled over? I go like. Probably because I was speeding, officer. <laughs> okay, I apologize. And we have a dialogue. And normally, uh, for the most part, they kind of let me off with a warning. And now, if I have an attitude, a bad attitude of, hey, why are you stopping me? And I know why I got stopped. Come on. Or if the officer is trying to, I don't know, pick a fight, who knows? Then things get out of, out of hand. So, uh, you know, long story short, uh, when I said we need a person in D.C., they said, why not that be you? Because you worked there for several years and you have some connections. So that's what they did. Thank you, thank you. Danny, you got more questions, I see. Yeah, we got two more. Uh, so so the next one's from Jordan Less. Uh, how do you empower your teams to make tough decisions and to know when they need to involve you in the decision? That's an excellent question. So I, I do something called templating, all right? I, I often say I don't have a problem with working myself out of a job. So when I engage, I tell people, uh, subordinates, superiors, whatever, I tell them everything. Uh, I tell them that, hey, you know, here's the funny thing about it is that, um, you know, here's a newsflash. There aren't any perfect people on this planet. I haven't met any uh, any perfect people yet, okay? When you guys meet a perfect person, stir them my way because I would love to learn from them. But uh, there aren't any perfect people. You got, you're got going to make a mistake. Uh, you're going to make a mistake. But the big thing is to um, basically realize your mistake, acknowledge your mistake, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, learn from that mistake, and don't make that mistake over and over again, all right? That actually puts people at ease. And I learned that from, remember that mentor I had, Colonel Tagney? Uh, when I got into Special Forces as a second lieutenant, I told him, hey, sir, I'm kind of worried that I may not be able to uh, do well here because I'm, I'm just a lieutenant. And he said, hey, uh, you know, uh, Lieutenant Thomas, we're not the 82nd Airborne Division. We don't eat our young. You can make a mistake uh, once, all right? But don't keep making the same mistake over and over again. So I tell my teams all that. And I tell them, here's the other thing too. If something goes wrong, it's better to send up that flare, okay, and get people to help you and interact. Don't hide it, all right? The worst thing in the world, at least for me, uh, and uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty easy going, but I can spin up if you give me a situation, a bad situation, that is too late to fix it. And you knew about it days ago, weeks ago, <laughs> whenever ago. So everybody understands, it's like, yeah, Okay, here's a good example. Lead by example, uh, you know, make mistakes, uh, fix them, learn from the mistakes, keep moving on. Always call in help, all right, because it's better to kind of uncover stuff early on so you can fix it as opposed to wait till the last minute when nobody can do anything. And the other thing, too, is that, you know, particularly in Western cultures, uh, I guess everywhere, everybody's afraid of making a mistake. You guys are. We're all, we're all taught that uh, as children. Hey, you want to get an A on the test. Well, the way you get an A on the test, you don't make any mistakes on the test, right? So when you make a mistake, all of a sudden people feel badly about themselves, right? 
the best thing I ever got uh, uh, for me or, or had happen to me is my dad would take me to the barbershop once every month or two to get a haircut. And I was like, I don't know, 9, 10, 11 years old. I would always sit there and listen to those old timers talk. And I wasn't listening for all the stuff that they had done right. I was listening for the stuff that they had done wrong. And it was giving me a leg up because I could tell myself, don't do that, okay? Don't, don't make that mistake. And so uh, with the people that I, I have either working for me or people I mentor, I tell them that, you know, um, take calculated risk. Don't be crazy and jump. You know, if somebody jumps off a cliff, you jump off uh, after them. Take a calculated risk. And if you make a mistake, all right, you got one big thing out of that. One great positive thing is that you learned from that mistake not to do that again, all right? All right, thank you. We have one more question, please. Danny? Yeah, so the next one's from Olivia Haynes from the Bernstein Center. So you, uh, your lived experiences have really helped shape your inclusive leadership style. Can you share with us some key strategies you employ to champion equity and access across genders, races, nationalities, um, in your professional career? Yeah, actually, okay, an excellent question, Olivia. It all boiled down with me is that um, I played uh, organized sports as a kid. I, I wasn't very good at it, obviously, otherwise I'd be a professional, whatever. But I, I, I learned to kind of be inclusive, okay, to use all your assets. And then it was reinforced in special operations. Special forces, uh, you know, Green Beret, SEALs, uh, Delta, uh, uh, whatever. It's a very small organization. And we're taught to use all of our assets, all of our assets, all right? Uh, I remember when the sergeants were talking to us, I said, hey, you know, uh, what we learned in Vietnam is that uh, the, the Viet Cong and whatnot, they were using women as combatants too, okay? The American psyche back then was that, no, women are supposed to be nurses way back in the rear, whatever. Well, these guys were fighting a total war, so they were using all their assets. In special operations, we're taught that. Use all of your assets, you know, uh, men, women, okay, uh, uh, black, white, it doesn't matter. Use all your assets. And so when I come into an organization, I always tell them this one uh, important kind of thing is that guys, I don't have any favorites because I just met you guys. I just met you, okay? So I don't have any favorites. Um, don't worry about trying to impress me because I'm, I'm one of these people that uh, I don't like uh, kiss ups or yes people because those guys, when things go wrong, they're gone. They, 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 they're, they're gone, they, they, they don't know you. Okay. And then the other thing was that to, to make sure that um, they, they had room to learn and to grow. And I always promoted listening. Uh, I always, I always would joke around. It's like, you know, I, I have these little eyes. Okay. Uh, and, but I have these big ears and they listen very well. I, I listen to everybody and I try to teach people that there's no bad idea. There are ideas that may not be the best idea, but there's no bad ideas. People say, although there's, there's no uh, stupid questions. It's like, well, there's some silly questions, but they're not really stupid. If you're trying to advance the ball and, and, and win the game. In fact, here's my last little vignette. When I was uh, at Stanford undergrad, I used to uh, referee intramural basketball. It was helping me build my wind up uh, for ROTC and our physical fitness exams and stuff like that, running backwards and forwards. There was a guy who was refereeing with me he was, a, he was a, 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 a grad student in, in physics. He was a big guy, too, so I don't understand physics, but whatever, it doesn't matter. Don't judge a book by its cover. Well, he had this ring on. It was a big ring. I'd never seen anything like that before, and so I asked him at halftime. I said, hey, um, um, what kind of ring is that? And he looked at me, and he said, oh, you never seen one of these before, huh? I go, like, no. He goes, this is an NCAA championship ring. Because uh, he, I think he played for a University of Miami or whatever when they won the national championship. He said, I was third string. I only played in a few games, and I didn't play in the championship game. But I got the ring. Because he's on the team. He's on the that team. That is a fantastic story, Mark. Thank you, yep, you so want, much. We had... want to make sure that that team succeeds. That team succeeds, you're going to succeed too. Yeah, that's wonderful. Wow, that's a, those are great stories. Thank you for sharing with us. I always Surely. say the MBAs at Columbia Business School are so interesting. You know, all these people who have stayed in touch over the years have such exciting lives. And I really, really appreciate your willingness to be very candid in telling us about some of the 
the ethical dilemmas that you have, have encountered. Is there anything you'd like to say uh, in the way of, of giving advice to the MBA students who are going to be going out and becoming leaders um, and have to act ethically very, very soon? Yeah, again, you know, uh, and thank you, Professor, for saying that. I mean, we owe a lot of our successes to people like you. You know, I, I remember telling you that when I was a kid, I had a, uh, a fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Boucher, who came into the inner city and taught. And she, fact, in fact, took a, a bunch of us off to Stanford and it opened up my whole world. The advice that I would give to uh, MBAs and any, any student going out into the workforce is this, okay? Um, it's not as bad as people make it out to be. All right. Um, it, 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 it's always going to get better. The more you have uh, people like yourselves exposed and interacting in those organizations, the better off they become. OK, um, guys like me, uh, we're we're I guess we're now old school, but I was I guess never old school because I always listened and thought that well, like it doesn't matter who tells me what it can be an older person, it can be a younger person. It's a good idea. It's a good idea. So I would say this. OK, when you walk in the door. Uh, always kind of say, how can I contribute to this organization? They, they love that. How can I help you guys get to the next level? Um, that's what I told my battalion commander when I first got hired in special ops is, sir, um, how can I help the battalion? Okay. And he said, well, how do you think you can help? And I said, well, sir, I know I'm going to be here for 36 months. First 18 months is on battalion staff. The second 18 months, I'd like to get a special forces 18. And remember, I keep saying, be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. He gave me an 18 two months later as a, <laughs> as a lieutenant. OK, and the, then the sky was the limit, um, you know, uh, aim for the stars, guys, aim for the stars, because even if you miss, you end up on the moon. OK, or actually the saying is aim for the moon, because even if you miss, you will end up amongst the stars. And so it's like dream big, dream really big and uh, things will happen. Don't the old school characters where I had to get all this stuff done in one, two, three, four years. OK, we had a time schedule, a timetable. Now that I look back on it, it's like, mm, no. Uh, for some people, yeah, one, two, three is fine, but you might be one and then two and then three. I mean, look, okay, I have um, four degrees. I always say I have uh, more degrees than a thermometer, and I don't know what to do with them, okay? Um, they didn't just happen overnight. What happened was uh, when I was a kid, I was told, hey, you're a smart kid. You got to be a doctor, a medical doctor. And I said, yeah, that sounds good. Dr. Thomas, that sounds like a good one. Yeah, I'll do that. I went to work at Stanford Hospital one summer as a, as a high school kid, and I hated it because a hospital for me is very passive. The emergency room is very quick, very quick pace, but the rest of the hospital is very slow. All right. So it's like, now I got to be true to myself. What do I like doing? I like building things and I, and I like either organizations or people. So I should be an engineer, but I don't want to be just an engineer. I keep hearing all these lawyers saying that they run the world. So I want to get a JD MBA. Yeah, JD MBA. The MBA is because I like business. I like building things. I like creating opportunities. All right. I remember um, when I was a White House fellow and we were reading applications, one of the older fellows asked me, he said, Hey, you're not long for the military. He didn't know that I was thinking about getting out of the military, but I went, Well, that, well what do you mean? He goes, Well, what's the most, what's, what's giving you the most pleasure in the military? And I told him, We built this one bridge in Africa. It was a very simple bridge, a log bridge, it didn't require much engineering. He said, well, private equity, he goes, how would you like to build 100 of these bridges, 1,000 of these bridges? And I said, I'd be fantastic. He goes, well, that's what private equity does, okay? It gives you the opportunity to do more and more and more to do a, a multiplier. So long story short, uh, short, too late, uh, guys, keep dreaming. Uh, if you have a setback, do what we do. It's called the bounce back theory, okay? Pick yourself up, dust yourself off, learn from your mistake, whatever, and keep going. The people are the most successful in the world are the people that are living in the present and thinking about the future. The people that are not successful or have the most problems in the world are people that are reflecting on the past. Like, how could I, I should have done that differently. I can't believe I made that mistake. It's like, don't, don't be your worst enemy. Uh, when I was playing basketball, we called these guys a self check. Okay. Don't have to guard them because they're going to doubt themselves and they're going to miss. So don't doubt yourself. Be your biggest fan. Okay. Reach out to others. All right. Help people along the way. All right. And as Colonel Tagney would always say, go out and do great things for God and country and you'll be fine. Those are excellent words to live by. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you, 
Danny and Amanda and Olivia and Shirley and everybody for this wonderful session. We really appreciate you attending. You guys are so, so welcome. And thank you for inviting me. You know, you guys have done a fantastic job. Um, Professor Herrick can, can give you or Danny or whomever, or Shirley can give you my email. If you guys want to get in touch, I don't mind uh, talking to you all about anything. So again, good luck in your MBA career. I know you guys will do fantastic and uh, have a great day.